Um, thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here, and I would especially like to thank the Dana Gadvila Foundation for bringing me to uh, Vitautas Magnus University um, to lecture to you today. Um, so the title of my talk is Outbreaks of Bark Beetle and Right-Wing Nationalism, the Communist Past in the Biao Vieja Forest. I am a professor of anthropology and environmental studies at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. And uh, I want to explain some things to you. Uh, this is my recent book, Foresters, Borders, and Bark Beetles, The Future of Europe's Last Primeval Forest, which was published in the autumn of 2020 by Indiana University Press. Um, I do research in cultural anthropology. If you know nothing about cultural anthropology, our method is called deep hanging out. Um, and that's very different than what sociologists do. That means we spend a lot of time with people um, in intimate conversation. And we try to also do interviews and learn languages that are not our own, um, to think in a comparative perspective around the world. How do people make meaning at a cultural level? Um, so I was very interested in coming to this part of the world in the early 90s because I was young and in college then when the revolutions in this part of the world were happening. And uh, I knew I wanted to travel to Eastern Europe. Uh, my family background is Lithuanian and Polish. And, uh, but I needed to uh, work to make money to do that. So I worked at the United States Forest Service on the Olympic Peninsula um, in Washington State. And there were some Polish foresters that visited our offices on a State Department exchange. And they told me about the Białowieża Forest. So I had a few contacts. And I went there for the first time in 1995. Uh, then I did a master's thesis in 1998 to 1999, and I spent a whole year in this forest. Um, I could have stopped there, but I kept going, and I did doctoral thesis work, um, spending another year and a half in 2005, 2006, um, and visited many, many times, sometimes for six months, three months, two weeks. Um, so basically, this book came out of, um, you know, 20 years, more than 20 years of visits and experience. This is uh, called long-term ethnography. And the question that this book looks at, which is a little different than the questions I might have asked in my master's thesis or doctoral thesis, is how are the communist and the peasant past entangled in both forestry and the politics of nature conservation? Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about the communist past um, and ways of thinking about communism. But I want to start by looking at my methods again. Who did I talk to? Um, so this is a picture of me with some friends, um, informants, sitting on a porch. Um, sometimes I would drink alcohol with them, but not too much. Um, that's a good way to get to know people. Uh, Anyway, this is, um, you know, kind of a museum representation of the village um, called Wisconsin. Um, people have been inhabiting this area, uh, well, several hundred years, 600 years or more. But I also spoke with foresters. Now, these are the folks that log the forest. Um, this forest is both uh, an ancient, uh, forest that is a national park area, and it's a commercially logged forest, and I'm going to be getting into the politics of that. I spoke with biologists, both those who are Polish and those who came from places like Denmark and the Netherlands and Spain, um, who were doing research both in the lab, um, for example, doing radio telemetry on where wolves are going, um, or in the field and then in the lab, and trying to uh, think about how different animals are connected from Biovieja to Siberia, for instance. Where do wolves travel? Um, again, uh, trying to ask local people about what um, the changes since uh, the times of communism have meant in their lives. Uh, we have both people who consider themselves ethnic Belarusians and ethnic Poles that live in this forest region, um, which is 150,000 uh, square kilometers, or sorry, hectares. Um, yeah, so here I am, um, 
sometime in that 25-year period. I forget how old I was there. Uh, but I'm also talking with ecological activists. Uh, these are people that uh, would defend the cutting of this forest. Um, some of them were living um, inside this forest. They grew up there. I mean, not they weren't directly inside the forest, but in villages within the forest. And others came from places like Warsaw and Hungary and Canada and all over the world. Um, I was also talking with uh, former prime ministers, that's uh, Vodimir Cimoshevich um, there, with um, Orthodox priests and officials from Belarus at the border crossing. OK. Um, so as you know, um, kind of the same history for Lithuania here, communism begins in Poland at uh, the end of World War II. Um, and, uh, and I'm thinking about, you know, where, where is communism, this thing that has already passed, in relation to this old growth forest? This is a picture from the Strict Reserve National Park. Um, and this is a very biologically complex forest. Uh, this beautiful photo was taken by my dear friend Janusz Korbel, who died in 2015. And it's, it's very hard to photograph a forest like this because everything gets lost in the shadows. So I really like this photo showing the mossy logs um, of downed trees that are not removed from the forest floor um, and the very tall, um, that's probably an oak, but it could be a linden. Some of these trees are 500, 600 years old. Um, the forest is an admixture of young and old trees, not just old trees. Um, there are some spruce and pine. Um, it's a very complex place with all eight species of European woodpecker. There's bison, wolves, lynx, uh, thousands of species of fungi on the forest floor. Okay, so the forest here is located at the border between Poland and Belarus. Um, I was mostly studying what happened on the Polish side of the forest. Um, just as a quick point of reference, uh, the forest is split in two um, at, at the Yalta agreements, um, with half of the forest going to the Soviet Union at that time, and uh, the forest became a hunting ground for um, Soviets. Um, and was quite well protected as a hunting ground, meaning there was not logging on the Belarusian side. I'll get to the history of the other side, or what was once a whole forest. But just to show you, there's a strict reserve national park in the middle there, the kind of purple color, um, surrounded by uh, slightly blue, and that's area that was expanded as national park in 1996. And then this area in green is state forest land um, with some protective reserves within that state forest land. Um, here's another picture just to kind of visualize um, that in a different way. This is a map I once created myself. And then we, on this map, um, we're seeing all of the villages that exist um, within the forest um, on the outskirts of the forest. Um, you're seeing old growth stands above 100 years old within the commercial forest. Um, this map was made prior to 2017 when there was a lot of logging that went on. Uh, but biologists really saw the state forest lands um, as uh, an area that could become uh, better preserved through a national park. Um, and that didn't happen like they thought it would. OK, and here's what the border between Poland and Belarus looked like until very recently. Some of you may know that there's now a three meter high uh, metal fence that's separating Belarus and Poland uh, due to um, a complicated refugee crisis, which I won't be going into in this lecture, but happy to talk to you about that another time. So, the Strict Reserve, Białowieża National Park, um, founded in 1931. Um, this is what some of the old growth looks like on the state forest lands. Um, state forests are founded about the same time, 1928. 
Um, and uh, I want to point out that it is communist modernity that shapes the way this forest looks. Um, but it's, this forest could also look like this due to capitalist modernity. Uh, but what I will explain to you what was the fate of the forest um, during communist times, but I'd like to give you um, a little bit of history before I do that. The question, again, I'm asking in my book is, how do you read the communist past in nature? How do you interpret it? Can it be seen in trees and waters as well as in symbols of communism, architecture of communism, that kind of thing that we're so accustomed to thinking of when we think of, oh, the Soviet past here in Konas is this building, right? Or this spatial layout. But let's think about that in relation to a forest. A forest um, that has seen bark beetle outbreaks recently because there were a lot of spruce planted in the forest during the communist period. And again, if this were Sweden or someplace else, we probably also would have seen a lot of spruce planted. Um, spruce are a very commercially valuable type of tree for forestry. They grow fast, they grow straight timbers, um, but there's, there's a lot of even age spruce stands. Um, and due to climate change, the, um, the area is drying out. Spruce do not have deep root systems, they have shallow root systems, and they're very susceptible to bark beetle attacks at the moment. So how did this forest ever become what is known as Europe's last primeval forest? So the forest was protected um, since the time of Yegewo. Um, so we're talking about uh, the Battle of Grunwald. Uh, 1412, forgive me if my date is wrong, but I think that's it. And uh, Yagewo comes to the Biovieja forest to hunt for meat, to feed the troops, so killing bison. And, uh, and so the, the, the troops can fight at the Battle of Grunwald. And uh, since that time, it has been protected as a royal hunting ground by Polish and Lithuanian rulers. And then when... Uh, the Commonwealth goes off the map of Europe. Um, the area is seized by Catherine the Great, who um, disposes Polish um, gentry of their lands. Um, I mean, many of them did not own land in the royal forest, uh, but um, she gives um, these Polish manors to her uh, favorite Germans, uh, the the local people had a special kind of status. They were not simple serfs or simple peasants. They had title to land. They helped when the royalty came to hunt. But when Catherine the Great um, seized this area, all of that ended and uh, people did not have title to their land. Uh, so the czars also at some point uh, protect the area as their royal hunting ground. Uh, Catholic churches are banned. Um, people are forcibly converted to the Orthodox Church. It's not entirely clear to me, you know, are people here forever Catholic or forever Orthodox? And uh, I think some people might want to try to answer that question, but I just want to say for, you know, more than 120 years, this area is the Russian Empire. People think of themselves as uh, part of that experience. And then World War I comes along um, and Germans begin industrially logging the forest using local slave labor. Uh, they set up the first uh, sawmills. Uh, they send railway lines through the forest and uh, heavily, heavily log the forest. Even as there are German nature conservationists who are screaming out, no, not this forest. Uh, this forest should have special protection. Um, there was a nature conserver conservator named Hugo Kovens, who was trying to um, stop his own German, fellow Germans from logging the forest. So that idea is circulated that this should become a national park. Um, and 
in the interwar period after Poland gains its independence. Um, as you know, in Lithuania, you have the Polish-Soviet war continuing and uh, there's fierce debates over this region. Um, when the 1919 census is taken, and I do not know who the census takers were and if they asked people which ethnicity they are, but in the census records, uh, we're looking at you know 90 percent of the population that identifies as Belarusian, 10 percent or probably even less as Polish, and then um, there were about 1,200 Jews living in the area. So, um, but um, this is a tense period, and there are many competing ideas in this part of the world about uh, what that vision of Poland is going to look like, which includes Lithuania, who's going to be where. So on my left, we have Józef Pilsudski, who believes in a multi-ethnic Poland. And uh, the guy with the thinner mustache is Roman Domowski, um, who's very anti-Semitic, um, who really believes that um, Poland should be for ethnic Poles, and that certain ethnicities can be ingested that they can become Polish, but certainly not Jews, for instance. Um, and in this complex milieu, sorry, let me go back, um, we have uh, Polish foresters come back to the area in the guise of state forestry, um, in the guise of the national park. And because the Western Belarusian Communist Party is operating here, um, uh, people from this area had been taken away during World War I, sent um, deep into the Soviet Union. They come back with ideas about Leninism. Um, that's not to say that all people uh, wanted Bolshevism for the region who were ethnically Belarusian, but there was certainly a vocal and strong uh, group of people that wanted um, this area to be the Soviet Union and Poles wanted this to, they said this is Poland. Of course, we know the borders were um, much farther east in today what is, what is Belarus in terms of this forest. Um, yeah, and so Polish foresters are here and they want to Polonize the forest. Uh, and uh, this is a reaction to what they see as uh, communism creeping into the forest. So it's our first moment in which we're thinking about communism in relation to the forest. So Belarusians are prohibited from working in the sawmills, from in the timber industry, as teachers. There are some Belarusian schools set up, but then they're also closed down shortly thereafter. Um, yeah. So um, let me skip a slide here. OK, so here we have Polish foresters. Um, again, who are very clear that they are Polish, that they need to act as a militia, that they need to organize outside their duties of cutting trees, and they're using all the infrastructure that the Germans set up for this area. Um, yeah, And here we have the Western Belarusian Communist Party. Um, some interesting things that happen in that interwar period is that a forester's manor mysteriously burns down. Um, there are communist propaganda um, leaflets going around talking about uh, Belarusians not having work. Uh, there are massive protests of unemployed Belarusians. And again, viewed as very suspicious um, and unreliable for work. Uh, the World War II period as one in which we see Germans back in the forest, um, uh, oftentimes removing people from the forest villages because they're afraid that they will uh, protect partisans who come in the night, so um, a great deal of violence. And uh, Hermann Goering requisitions the whole area as his private hunting ground. There is some logging in the strict reserve at this time. Um, but this moment passes, okay? This moment uh, passes and it doesn't pass easily, but we have communist Poland, as you all know, after World War II, and uh, a lot of foresters died during the war. They were in the military, 
they were killed at Katan, they were sent away to Siberia. We don't have a big cadre of forester employees working here right when the war ends. So somehow the communist government needs to find people to work in state forestry. And when I interviewed um, uh, children of people who had been foresters, I mean, so now adults, but they had been children in this, in an earlier period, and they told me that their fathers had to hide their biographies to work in state forestry, um, that they came from other parts of Poland. Again, so we have more Poles moving to this region, but it's an, also an era in which ethnicity is supposed to be put aside. And nobody's supposed to talk about whether or not they're Polish or Belarusian. It's just a new period. You are citizens of the People's Republic of Poland, and anyone can get a job in state forestry. Um, people are classified in this region as worker peasants. Um, so most people have small farms that they live off of, but they also work for the forester, work planting trees, for instance, anytime the forester needs them to do that work. There are many intermarriages. Um, and people that I talked to throughout the 1990s and 2000s uh, recall the communist period with some fondness. And I don't know if those people, you know, some of them were born in the 1950s. I'm not going to say the decade after World War II was one that people remember fondly but people who were then in their 60s or 50s were talking about, oh, that was a good period, you know, maybe referring to the 1970s or 80s, but where uh, people felt like they had a future in the village. Um, the forest, though, was treated just like any other forest in Poland. It wasn't treated as some kind of exceptional primeval forest. Um, it was uh, subject to five-year plans where there were often cutting, uh, cutting plans that uh, exceeded what could be the total harvest of the forest. Um, and then, as you can see, just very densely planted in conifers, um, mostly Norway spruce, but also pine, for instance. Okay, so people sent their children to technical forestry high schools and again, it was not a place where you talked about ethnicity. Um, it was a place where you learned how to cut trees, grow trees. Um, it was a place where many uh, Belarusians who wanted to see their children advance would send their children. Uh, forestry seemed like a good job, a place to get ahead. Um, and after a period of feeling very much less and persecuted, uh, Again, people remember this era fondly. Okay, so I show up in the mid-1990s, and uh, the biologists that I speak to are very interested in developing civil society. Not only do they want to see the whole area become a national park, they think what we need to do here is to decommunize the forest, that we need to get rid of a way of thinking that existed during communism. And we're going to do that not just by doing our biological studies in the forest, we're going to convince uh, Pani Luda to open a private store um, that will, a private shop so people can buy food. And we're going to start these independent newspapers that talk about Pani Luda's you know, private store and talk about uh, how to appropriately educate our children about uh, the the history that existed here before communism happened. And many biologists that I talk to are convinced uh, that foresters are still communistic. And it is that foresters um, are not reforming themselves like the biologists are. So they make these comparisons. And kind of at the center of this um, is the spruce bark beetle. Um, here's a a poster I found deep in the forest, so bicycling along, no houses for many kilometers, and here's this poster, uh, wanted for killing 25,000 spruce in 2001. Um, biologists thought that there were too many bark beetles because during the communist period, there were so many spruce planted and that the bark beetle were actually 
doing an ecological role. The foresters, on the other hand, were concerned that if they weren't allowed to manage the whole forest, um, it would all die because the, sp the spruce bark beetle would kill all the trees off. So, um, local people uh, told me that uh, they were very angry at biologists, that they saw foresters as being more local somehow than biologists, that biologists were hungry for careers, but foresters protected local people. I should add at this time, just like all communist state industries, state forestry had to downsize its workforce. Um, it had to privatize uh, many jobs. So many, many people lost their work in this era. Um, state forestry became uh, like a private firm where it could use profits from selling trees um, to support itself um, and its activities. And uh, biologists were very critical of this. Uh, so biologists in the 1990s had written a plan to expand the national park over the whole forest. Um, and they had a great deal of agreement um, in the Polish same, but there wasn't any kind of final approval. Uh, but the environmental minister arrived in the year 2000 and to announce that the whole area was going to become a national park. And there was a plan for having foresters keep their jobs. They would just now work for the national park. Um, but people started protesting. And here we have a sign that says um, that these scientists are the cause of our poverty. Another sign that says, out Judas traitor, e kind of EU Judas traitor. Um, and uh, the biologists couldn't believe that local people were capable of organizing in this way. They said, oh, that must be a plot by the foresters. Um, and uh, local people were suddenly, I mean, after you have this intermixing, right, of Poles and Belarusians, and, and I arrive, and people are telling me in the 1990s, oh, there's, there's no conflict between Poles and Belarusians. We all get along. And that's partly because I'm an American asking you know, questions. I'm making friends, too, but I'm asking difficult questions. Uh, but suddenly, biologists, who are mostly ethnic Poles, not all, are telling me, this is a Belarusian trick, or it's a Belarusians are passive. Belarusians <laughs> supported communism. They can't possibly organize this protest. But they did, and the plans for the expanded national park fell apart, and, uh, and so the conflict began. Um, I think this poster is very interesting in comparison with the earlier poster that says, wanted for killing 25,000 trees. Um, so some of you might recognize this poster from um, uh, Solidarność, um, you know, representing the first day in Poland that um, voted for free and people voted in free and fair elections. And uh, that's Gary Cooper from the film High Noon, an American Western, where Gary Cooper in the film uh, you know, comes to a western town and he's not going to leave until the last villain is dead, okay? Um, and I think that's interesting also in relation to what happened with the way people remember the communist past in Poland. So, in the year 2005, uh, we have the party um, peace, um, which is the party that's in power now. They come to power. And they run on a platform uh, that communists have not uh, left power. So the post-communist party, SLD, which ruled Poland throughout much of the 1990s into the 2000s in different coalition governments, and it's quite complicated, so I won't go into all of Polish politics, but there's this discourse in 2005 um, that we must decommunize society. So here, I want you to pay close attention because what's happening is that, um, you know, 
between 1990s and the 2000s is that people were talking about foresters as being communistic and local people as being communistic vis-a-vis -vis their Belarusianness. But now Peace is saying uh, that, you know, that, um, you know, the whole society um, is too infiltrated with communists who unfairly used their privilege after the system fell um, to capture wealth um, and that we need to lustrate everyone, meaning like we need to out who the communists are. Um, and so now somehow the foresters are becoming those who are going to call other people communists. Um, and the foresters are going to begin to associate themselves as Polish and Polish not quite in the same way as in the interwar period, but um, still Polish. And there are people who are on the far right in Poland, so peace I would call the right, but not the far right, um, who revive the organization of Roman Dmowski, this uh, obuz narodowe radikalne, O-N-R. And they have marches in Warsaw on Poland's Independence Day um, that are not just about outing Muslims, or sorry, outing communists, but are that also talking about death to Muslims. I mean, very, very far-right, ultra-nationalist um, slogans. So how does this play again into our forest, into the materiality, the types of trees that are here? Um, let's talk about dead wood for a moment. So in this picture, which is um, taken in the, um, it could be in the state forest, nature preserves, or in the National Park strict protection area, you can see all the dead wood on the forest floor. Now foresters uh, thought that, um, and they have good reason, there's studies that show within the dead wood of spruce, you have this breeding ground for bark beetle. So state foresters are trying to maintain the commercial forest as a commercial forest, make a profit from it. And there's no way you can do that if you have bark beetle eating all your spruce. And so again, sanitary logging. But the biologists um, who are here, um, who work at three different scientific institutes, the Mammal Research Institute, the University of Warsaw Geobotanical Station, um, the National Park, and I should also say there's a state forest research institute there, um, the Institute of um, Forestry Research. Anyway, there are all these studies coming out of all of these organizations um, which talk about the importance of dead wood on the forest floor. And although biologists and ecological activists did not get their expanded national park after the year 2000, they did um, sit in many meetings that negotiated rules that would have to leave dead wood on the forest floor. Okay, so let's take this. Um, this is what the commercial forest looks like when you have this bark beetle damage and you can, you have some very tall trees that are being defoliated and eventually will fall over and uh, you have more dead wood on the forest floor. Okay. So this plays into the politics of who is orthodox, generally meaning Belarusian, but some people who are orthodox there think of themselves as Ukrainian more recently. And again, not recent arrivals, but people are kind of trying to understand in this place, uh, what does it mean that I go to the orthodox church? And I grew up with a slightly different dialect maybe then Poles that arrived later, or that maybe my grandmother spoke this and my grandfather spoke more Polish. Um, people were trying to negotiate with that. Um, but you have ways in which this conflict about bark beetle uh, 
will impact the way the far right is talking about who's a communist and who's on the left. Okay, so first order of business. Um, ecological activists, there's a few locals, but most are coming from the outside, from Warsaw, from Hungary, from Canada, from Spain, uh, but mostly Poles. And uh, they will do things like attach themselves to harvesting equipment, especially in 2017 when uh, the bark beetle outbreak was very bad and the Polish forester said, we need to log this forest a lot, much more than we ever have. So they increased the logging quotas by three times um, and there was international outrage. UNESCO had designated this forest as a world heritage site and they condemned the logging. The European Union said, you are breaking habitat protection laws. Um, you set up this area as a Natura 2000 area. This should be for birds and habitat protection. You need to pay 100,000 100, euros per day that you continue logging. Um, they took Poland to the EU court. Um, okay. Polish foresters showed up. Um, let me go back one. Um, Ecological activists here are compared to the bark beetle. They are called szkodniki, but also lewactwo, which is kind of like the um, American English term pinko that was used against communists during McCarthyism um, in the 1950s in the US. Um, so now it's the ecological activists who are called the communists, okay? There we go. And it is foresters who are suddenly authorized to carry guns in the forest. And they're tasked with removing these ecological activists from the forestry equipment. OK. There we go. OK, so in 2017, at the height of this conflict, the EU is condemning Poland. Polish foresters are saying, we're not going to let these internationals tell us what to do. We have a proud tradition of Polish forestry. Polish foresters have always been in this area. We have always been independent, uh, meaning that even during communist times, there was a clear sense that they were ethnic Poles, that there's a Polish tradition of forestry. And this comes right into ethnic politics again. So in Hainówka, the first march was either 2017 or maybe the fall or the winter of 2018 in February every year since there's been this march by uh, ONR which is the group that Roman Domowski founded the anti-semite in the interwar period and uh, I actually know the people who organized these marches like they were in their teens when I was there in the early 2000s and then they grew up and they had a Belarusian mother and a, or sorry, a Belarusian father and a Polish mother. But uh, they're convinced that this is the moment to organize these marches, um, not only because they are opposed to the ecological activists who are there, and these ecological activists are organizing um, along lines that are anti national, okay, that are about. LGBTQ rights, about feminism, about anarchism. I mean, like all of these you know, kind of far left ideas are coming into these camps um, in the forest area, which is also why these people are calling this group now communists, but this group wouldn't think of themselves as communists, the ecological activists. But suddenly the far right is there. The people that I used to live next to who were once teenagers are now saying we need to condemn these, these forest activists and it is the forester who's going to sort of save us from this uh, leftist communist way of organizing. So in, this wasn't everyone, but this was one of the Straż Leszna, the forest guards who was wearing a badge that said death to the enemies of the fatherland as he was trying to pull these ecological activist off of the equipment. Um, my former neighbors who were organizing these marches in Hainówka 
have on their Facebook page, um, you know, the sort of sign that says no. So it's a hammer and a sickle, this classic symbol of communism with a slash through it. And then all kinds of posts about how these people who chain themselves to the harvesting equipment should actually be crushed and killed by the harvesting equipment. Um, some of my favorite Elderly women in the village are talking about how these ecological activists should be lined up against the wall and shot. And uh, things become very ugly. So as I think about all of this in my research, I mean, the question that I ask is how to keep the radical gap open for flourishing ecologies and political outcomes? And I don't want to give you too much theory in this talk because I, I know I have a very general public audience and I don't know what your backgrounds are, but I just do want to flag that in the book I've written, I do talk a little bit about theory. And so I think both about, um, in ecological terms, a gap is maybe an opening. So a place in the forest where sunshine can come down on the forest floor and form something new, or a gap might be a space that's in between uh, this ecosystem and that ecosystem. So maybe you have, uh, I'm trying to use it very metaphorically. How can we think about flourishing ecologies and political outcomes in a place where in some ways we have the repeat of history, but I don't think it's quite the repeat of history. I think we have many political and social dynamics going on. So I try to draw from this body of theory called post-socialism, um, which in general is just trying to theorize what happened in this moment after, you know, the Communist Party and Communist Party rule of the state ended in Eastern Europe. Again, there's a lot of infrastructure that's left. Um, a lot of the theory coming out of here didn't want to look at capitalism and say, oh, it's the end of history. Capitalism is triumphant. We're trying to understand the way that capitalism in the post-socialist period is also producing political outcomes. We can't explain everything vis-a-vis uh, -vis this homo sovieticus, you know, that, oh, there was just one type of person that was created under these communist systems. We're trying to think about the plurality of experiences under socialism. Okay. And the other body of theory that I'm using is post-humanism. Um, and that might look like a lot of confusing words, but post-humanism just wants to think about the way... Uh, Humans are not the only political actors in the world. So something like the bark beetle, right, might be doing something to humans which are causing political outcomes. And that's not the same as saying the bark beetle have an agenda. Um, probably the bark beetle agenda is just to eat and reproduce, right? But we want to think about those other creatures as we're thinking about political outcomes. And we also want to think about this gap, this in-between, that, hmm, are there really sharp boundaries between what's happening at the ecological level and what's happening at the political and social level? I don't think so. That's the theory that's coming out of post-humanism. Okay, so post-socialism is trying to examine national revival, right? Communism was like, eh, no ethnic differences here. I don't see it, no. Trying to hide. So suppressing that national history, and then we get things after communism ends, like the Balkan Wars, right? Um, so let me talk about this now in relation to the forest. Um, this is a picture of a tree. <laughs> and down below here, we have these characters, these figures, which are supposed to be foresters. Um, this is the National Day of Memoring of uh, remembering the cursed soldiers. So in Polish, that would be Żołnierze Wyklętyk. Um, and these are soldiers who were part of Armii Krajowej, the home army, that did not put down their arms after communism began, after World War II. So in this region, these people who did not put down their arms went and killed some Belarusian inhabitants of the region. Uh, there were 
uh, 49 inhabitants that were killed, not right in the forest, but nearby, by people who used to be foresters, who were then part of this home army. And this history is really not talked about until after peace comes to power. Um, so here's the guy who pacified. Um, Bure is his code name as the cursed soldier, but Romualda Raisa Burego. Um, and he led a platoon in state forest defense in Hainufka, which is the logging town at the edge of the forest. Um, and here's another figure that's being very celebrated at the moment. And I have to say, um, she does seem quite heroic. Her, uh, her mother and father were both killed, one by the Gestapo and the other by the Soviets. And she's only 17, and she is running messages and maybe other things um, to partisans, to the home army. Um, and she's a symbol for the foresters. Both of her parents are foresters. Um, so she's a symbol of this kind of nationalist cause and also their persecution because the communists end up executing her um, after the war ended. Um, I believe it was in Gdansk. But she's a very celebrated figure today in terms of these local politics. Um, so um, there you have a picture of her with the Red Cross, a painting that was done by somebody recently of Danuta um, with foresters as a background in the forest. And here you have this right-wing march in Hainufka um, saying, we remember these cursed soldiers. And there's a picture of her um, and other foresters who were part of that. Now, uh, the local people who go to the Orthodox Church and think of themselves as Belarusian are mostly really concerned about this. They feel very uh, violated. They feel hurt by their neighbors. But again, this march was organized, one second, by um, a young woman. Um, and and uh, she ended up going to jail um, for uh, a kind of fight she had with a police officer. And uh, she, uh, the, the people who are organizing these marches were calling her a political prisoner. And they were asking for her release in one of these marches in nearby Hainufka. Um, but yes, another member of her family, though, was married you know, he was young and he got married in the Orthodox Church. Um, so just to sort of show you, like, there are some serious complications here in terms of ethnic identity. Um, and this doesn't mean, like, all of these conflicts don't mean that, um, oh, Belarusians support a forest that looks like this and Poles support, support a forest that looks like this. That's not the case at all. Um, there's a lot of people who are Poles and Belarusians who want a national park, and there are lots of Poles and Belarusians who want this area to be state forests. But there are ways in which these ethnicities are politicized in relation to the bark beetle, in relation to dead wood, in relation to uh, the forester being identified now as Polish, and what does it mean if you identify as Belarusian, but you work in state forests? And then, so you have you know, the right, which I would call peace, and then you have people on the far right. And peace doesn't want to claim them as belonging to them, but there's a kind of politics that are produced here around, um, around ethnicity. And one of the things I forgot to point out that I had written on that earlier slide with Danuta Shedjinkovna was, Instead of leaves hanging from trees, let's hang the communists. So that's what people were chanting during these marches, but instead, not just referring to uh, communists who were Belarusian after World War II, but this was also chanted and used in some ways against the ecological activists who are now seen as the communists. So another way that my book um, tries to analyze this is through the uh, lens of temporality. And that just means how do people live time and experience time? 
Okay, is time something that's cyclical? Like, oh, every year the birds come back and I do this activity. Or is there a break with time? So modernity likes to think of progress, right? There was the past um, and then there's the future. Um, so anyway, I just kind of want to flag if you're more interested in this, you can see the way that I'm thinking about temporality, temporality as a lens for thinking about how do people recover and use these histories of nationalism? How does time also distort what was communism and who was a communist um, and how do they bring that into some sort of imagined future? Okay. Um, so just a few more artifacts to show you here. Um, not only were um, ecological activists called communists, they were also called eco-terrorists. Um, this was um, a calendar that was put out by an organization that called itself Santa, which has nothing to do with Santa Claus, but uh, used this badger as its symbol. and. Uh, Anyway, they were trying to say, this is the uh, vision of the forest that is uh, promoted by foresters um, through this organization, Santa. Interestingly, the guy who made this calendar, people knew as somebody who was Belarusian, again, like ethnically Belarusian, went to the Orthodox Church. And this is the vision proposed by eco-terrorists. And as you can maybe see, there are mountains in the background. This is not... Um, from the Białowieża forest, but that's the vision proposed by eco -terrorists. This is one of the pages inside the calendar comparing Michelangelo deciduous forest to, again, the forest of death on the right with the deathly figure. And they're saying, do not depreciate the occupation or maybe the expertise of the forester. Um, so lots of things going on with some reference to a comic book there that was circulating, but I, I won't go into that. So anyway, here again, we have these two visions of the forest. Um, I mean, not the ideal of foresters. Uh, that one is also not the ideal of foresters, uh, because this is the strict reserve with the dead wood on the forest floor but maybe the production of this complex history, including that communist history. Okay, and um, I'll just end on a t-shirt uh, produced by ecological activists where you see how they try to celebrate the bark beetle. So the bark beetle becomes the symbol for rewilding, but also symbol for a whole set of politics um, that I would speak of as the kind of alter globalization left or the the new left in Poland. And then just kind of some summary points from the book. So the meaning of communism is not stable. Um, it certainly changes over time. Who gets called a communist? Um, are foresters communist? Is it the ecological activists who are communists? The biologists don't get called communists, by the way. They're a separate group. Um, but yeah, it's not just the historical moment of communism in Poland. That's not what my book is trying to do in thinking about what communism was. Um, and that communism is an idea about the past that circulates long after this communist system and communist party rule ends. Um, yeah, so I would just recommend that we study this communist past in relation to the forest not just as a former system, but as a way that people are experiencing time and place. So thank you so much for your attention. Yeah. And I welcome your comments and questions. Yeah, that's a thank you for the question. So yes, by biologists and ecological activists, and there are many biological papers about this, um, did not see bark beetle as a problem for the forest because um, uh, they saw it as kind of a, I don't want to use the word sanitation because that's the word foresters use, but 
The bark beetle is toppling over these dead spruce and the dead spruce create habitat. Lynx like to walk over these dead um, trees. There are all sorts of fungi that grow out of this area. There's a very rare bat, Barbastella barbastella, that we're seeing in these areas that had bark beetle outbreaks. Um, new spruce are continuing to grow up without any foresters. So the biologists who want this area to become a national park and want this area to retain its biological integrity are saying, bark beetle are native. They're not a threat to the forest. We should celebrate them. Uh, foresters are saying, uh, we have always managed this forest. I mean, there are some old women in the forest who say, I planted this forest. You know, that this forest is not just some spontaneous creation. So this is where the fault line is. Um, and the foresters are concerned that uh, we might not even have forests here in the future. Maybe it would all become grassland, but the biologists want to say, you know, if you look at that strict reserve, there's a lot of deciduous trees in there. There are some spruce. Um, spruce will not go away entirely, but we also have to consider climate change. I mean, where we have climates that are drying out, there's less water in the forest. The spruce are going to topple over anyway, and we'll just have this continuation of bark beetle. But also, when you have the national park, which allows all this dead wood, and these, if you remember the map of state forest lands that had all of these patches of old growth and new rules where some dead wood needs to be left on the forest floor, it's impossible to actually manage for bark beetle in this forest because you're going to have continuing outbreaks. But again, if a forester was up here standing next to me, you might hear a different story. But it's a tough task for an ecologist because if he or she should not mediate, right? Between, yeah. the, between two or three sides that we have here. And so what was your experience as a mediator? Did yeah. You, did you try to become one or did they, did they see you as, you know, oh, she could be, you know, she's impartial. Yeah. She could, yeah, so uh, in 1998, I had an office um, at the IBEL, the Institute of Forestry Research. Um, and this is a research institute that has existed since 1928 when State Forest was founded. And its goal is to do research on what they call natural forests. And there are foresters that come through there. It's an organization that belongs to State Forest. Um, there are a few very important studies that have come out of that research institute um, by uh, Jurek Gutowski, uh, really talking about the bark beetle and it, the important work this bark beetle does to renaturalize stands. There are many other studies that come out of this research institute about, you know, just how to grow trees um, and for, for commercial use. So, being at this research institute early on gave me a lot of access to foresters, to local people. Then when I went back for my doctoral dissertation, I decided to have an office with the Mammal Research Institute, which was much more interested in nature protection. Um, and I also um, was in a village where I was the English teacher um, for a school that was trying to educate um, a lot of youth that would come from other parts of Poland. So I had many different hats that I would put on. And at some point in my doctoral thesis, I realized that being neutral wasn't going to get me anywhere. <laughs> Next question. Yes, because when you try to be neutral, sometimes people don't want to talk to you and you don't get close. So I tried to, you know, I never, was part of um, an activity that made it so clear which side I was on. Uh, but I was definitely became sympathetic to those who wanted to protect the forest. But I still told everybody, like, I'm very interested in what you think. And I didn't always announce um, what position I had on some issue. But it becomes hard when, you know, I go there in 2017 and my favorite elderly woman who's always fed me and given me honey said, are you an eco-terrorist too? <laughs> you know, and so I tell her, oh, I'm not an eco-terrorist. Um, but, you know, why, why 
do you have the position that you do? Or could you tell me more about what you think the eco-terrorists are doing? Um, so I always tried to keep communication open. And even during this last visit, I went there. And uh, you know, some people told me that maybe Putin is right. And I had to sort of you know, just listen, even though I certainly don't agree. Um, that was one person amongst many people who live there. I don't want to present that as, oh, this position belongs to this type of person. Um, yeah, but it becomes harder and harder for me to, I don't think I will go back and do more research there. Um, but I also don't think you can really understand a conflict by staying neutral forever. Um, and I think if you read my book, you'll see the way I try to nuance that conflict. But I also would give talks at the local library, which were not about this conflict, but they were kind of talks about what I thought was interesting in these villages or in these places. Or I gave a talk at the Technical Forestry High School about history of Poles and Belarusians. And some people said to me, you know, like, I never knew that before. I didn't know that about my own history. We don't learn history at the Technical Forestry High School unless it's Polish history. Um, so yeah, you know, and I, w I also gave a talk at the Mammal Research Institute last summer, um, which is in Białowieża. And I don't know if all of the biologists agreed with my interpretation of this place. So I think that there is a real value in being an outsider and trying to present uh, the way you see something, but of course my story is partial. Um, that doesn't mean it's not true, it just means it's one piece of the way people see and experience this place. But I tried my best to triangulate, like who are all the people in this place? And the stories that I tell in my book are very much about individuals that I knew, and in some cases I tried to make their identities anonymous. And in other cases, if the people died, I try to list those people by name or talk about them. Like, who is the biologist who was so anti-communist, but then people think maybe she's actually facilitating a type of communist cronyism in this place. Um, I hope that answers your question. Oh, I don't, I don't know, but you know, um, I will say this area has always had different types of people living there, that there's no autochthonous original people, even though I'm sure many people there could trace their ancestry back 600 years, you know, that there, uh, there is such... DNA and experiences in this place, but then you can't think of it without also thinking of uh, what happened to the Jews in this um, place? What happened to the czars and those administrators? Who were all the ethnic Poles that moved here? Were some of those Belarusians once Catholic, Roman Catholic, and did that matter? When did they begin to be called Belarusian and not just Tutaishe, meaning I'm from here? So what's happening right now is you have a lot of people from the city who are moving there and it costs a lot of money to live there, you know, like real estate prices really going up. And so how is that changing the politics of this place? I don't know yet. Um, I mean, there's still people who say, I'm local, you're from the outside. There's a word for outsiders, Navalodj, which is in the local dialect means like, kind of like the new scum, the uh, new, you know, people we don't like. Um, it's very derogatory word. Um, and so, you know, people who have arrived in the last 10 years joke, I'm Navalodj, but then there's also biologists who have lived there and raised their kids there and they came in 1950, but they say, I'm Navalodj, you know, like nobody will accept me as local here. But then people who move there to work in state forestry who can say, well, I'm local, but they also moved there in the 1950s or the 1970s. So um, I think it's still a very polarized moment and especially with the border wall that just went up um, in the, um, about a year ago. Um, yeah, there's a lot of soldiers there. There's still people crossing from uh, Belarus who are Syrian and Afghani and people dying, like dying 
uh, you know, like 100 meters out, outside of the urban area of Hainufka. I mean, and um, this is also causing another set of social conflicts, and you can imagine, but I don't have time to talk about all that today. Yeah, maybe one more question, and feel free to leave if you Does need to. Does the tourism industry have any voice here? Yeah, but you know, a lot of, um, so biologists in the 1990s, with the help of WWF, um, you know, a Danish fund, uh, Dutch people, uh, they were really promoting tourism as the solution. Oh, once people can live off of tourism, they will then support nature conservation. That's not exactly what happened, and people do live off of tourism, and some people have gotten, um, I won't say very wealthy, but they do well for themselves in Poland, especially compared to other areas. Um, I mean, it was a very hard year when the uh, refugee crisis was happening because no one was allowed to go to the forest. There were no tourists allowed, so. Um, but yes, uh, many people, I would say most people now have some kind of tourist operation or work in the hotels. There are three big hotels there now. Uh, but you also have a lot of tourism that cares nothing about this forest. So you have, uh, you know, auto industry group going to this forest to have a conference. And you're like, why? <laughs> why this forest? Why not Poznan or some city? But um, there's a kind of conference tourism and also tourism that includes saunas, that includes uh, miniature golf, um, that's not about going to the forest to look for birds. And it's about, um, you know, like, let's have some very artificial looking grass and a fire pit and we'll sing songs together. But, um, you know, it's not about really like celebrating a kind of local history. Or for a while there was a lot of tourism kind of like in Lithuania with your, uh, maybe with the park of the Lenin statues, but you know, there was this very creative type who had a bar called Uvawoji at Lenin. And uh, you know, it was full of communist kitsch and he also had this little train ride that would go through the forest and as you're on this train ride, the communists would jump out of the forest and make you sign something that says, you're joining the communist party now. Um, anyway, his operation got closed down, but yes, all of these, there are all these forms of tourism where there used to have the Tsar's Boudoir nightclub where uh, you'd have men in very tight leather pants and billowing shirts and it was a disco club. And uh, anyway, that closed down, but now we have the Tsar's restaurant. Um, and you know, the, the themes of these restaurants and these hotels keep changing, so. I don't think tourism helped people support the national park or nature conservation anymore. Yeah, but it could because there's also, again, new people who are living there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yesterday you visited. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yesterday you visited Marcinconis, right, and forest. Yeah. Uh, what were your impressions and what your thoughts about that? You know, uh, concerning this topic. Yeah. I mean, we had a wonderful tour, and I'm not going to remember the woman's name by this ethnographer who lives there, and uh, and uh, the, I, I'm embarrassed to admit there wasn't enough in English for me to really understand everything. But I mean, I could see it, the way in which uh, architecture is preserved there. I mean, I, I understood from my hosts that there are rules about what you can and can't do in terms of architecture. Um, I sensed from uh, my guide that people really care about, you know, ancient traditions and about stories that they have about their own heritage and their own history um, in a way I don't quite see in Bielowieża. So it wasn't clear to me, oh, what's the tourist infrastructure in this place? Uh, but I thought it was um, a beautiful and lovely forest, and of course with a very different history because it's an area that only becomes a national park in, I think it was 91. And, uh, you know, there are, you can see trenches from World War I that somebody showed me, um, these very thin pines. You have logging in the national park. Um, 
So I don't know what local people are saying, if they're happy about the logging and if, what sort of social conflicts exist there. But I thought it was a fascinating place and I definitely want to go back there and ask more questions. And the architecture was beautiful, the forest was beautiful, the river with its meanders was lovely.